If I were to tell you, and you knew I was telling you the truth, that at 2 o'clock this afternoon, the Lord would be here to visit with you. Just as we are with one another, He would be here in that way. He only have an hour. But he wants to visit with you. Would you be here? When we speak of the church assembling, we need to ask the question, what does the New Testament teach regarding the church assembling together, as the Bible will use that term? And most of the time when you read of the assembling together of the saints in the New Testament, they were assembling to worship God. And when we speak of worshiping God, one fundamental aspect of worshiping according to the teaching of the New Testament on the first day of the week <coughs> is the church assembling in order to do so. David displayed a grand attitude that ought to be incorporated in every Christian when he said in Psalm 122, verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now, we won't go into all the reasons David would say that, but nevertheless, whatever the reason, he was glad. For what? To go up to the house of the Lord, to enter into it. We're not saying that this land and this building is like the temple. Totally and completely as the law of Moses taught it to be under that system of worship. What we are saying is that we do come together. We do assemble. And we do in that assembly, each one of us join together in that assembly, worship God. So we should have the attitude of David and if we don't, what attitude do we have? Is, is it a sense of being just, well, i got to go again. and I'm just dragged here all the time, this kind of thing. But you know, as I, I pause here and, and insert this, in preaching on the importance, uh, a part of being faithful is assembling on the first day of the week with the saints to worship God. The sad part about it is that those really need to hear it aren't here. Because they're not assembling. As the New Testament obligates each Christian to do with the Lord's church on the first day of the week. Now, I, I pause here to further say, if you know of somebody who calls himself a Christian, as the New Testament defines the word, and they're not assembling, uh, would you take this recording and place it in their hands, not because I'm the greatest preacher on the earth, but because I do intend to teach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth on the assemblies of worship such as this on the first day of the week of the Lord's people. We take some things for granted. Some things, because we do them all the time, uh, we let them become just commonplace. David wanted to be where God said he should be to worship God under the old economy of the Mosaic law. So I say again, if Jesus was going to be here at 2 o'clock and said, now I've got just an hour to visit with you, would you be here? Because you see, we are assembled before the throne of God to worship Him now. And He is before us, knowing each one of our hearts, knowing why we're here and knowing how we engaged in these several acts of worship, singing and praying, the Lord's Supper, the giving of our means, and now the study of God's Word. We're here to show Him how much we love Him. We're here to show Him, according to His will, what our intentions are, what our purposes are, how we put first things first. And letting the Bible tell us what ought to come first. To worship God then acceptably on the first of the week requires Christians coming together.
our brothers and sisters in Christ assembling to worship God. Now worship, proskuneo, the Greek word used most often in the New Testament writings for worship, means to kiss the hand toward. It's an act from the heart, an act of falling down before one who's much higher than we are to give him his due obeisance. And thus, in these acts of worship, in this assembly of worship, that's what we're doing. It is act, an act or acts of devotion. I want to read with you the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to begin in verse 19. Hebrews 10 and verse 19. And we'll read through verse 27. Hebrews 10, 19 through 27. Now he's basing these remarks on remarks preceding, and he's drawing a conclusion based upon what he's already said. So he begins with, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Christ, or Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession or confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another as the New King James says, in order to stir up love and good works. The Old King James says to provoke one another unto love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And we would do well to ask here, well, what does remain? And he tells us, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Really what's being discussed here is the conversion of a person from one lost in sin to one who is saved and a child of God. Jesus has consecrated a new and living way through his sacrifice of himself, his body, on the cross. And as a result, we who believe and obey the gospel can enter into the holy place. Well, here's where you have to have some knowledge of the Old Testament and the law of Moses' Levitical system of worship that was the tabernacle. For you see, the tabernacle consisted of um, two divisions, the holy place, and then there was a curtain in the most holy place, or the holy of holies, wherein was the Ark of the Covenant. Now the holy place represents the church. Thus, when you're obedient to the gospel, as Acts chapter 2 tells us, on the day the Lord's church was begun, and you have believed in Christ, repented of your sins, and been baptized for the remission of sins, we learn that the Lord Himself, remember, He's the head of the church. He's the one that purchased the church with His blood. He adds those who are saved, their sins remitted, to the church, to the holy place. And that's from verses 19 and 20, if you want to read it in that present scripture. So the question is, at this point, at least one question to ask is, what is the new and living way? Well, he says we draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. If that's not belief in the process of becoming a Christian, I'd have a hard time to understand what it is since faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, and that's discussed in verse 22 of this passage. He says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, insofar as I know, having believed in Christ and then repenting of your sins... Acts 2.38 points out that a believer must then repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Then that repentance is spoken of when your conscience is clear. You have will to die to the purpose, practice of sin. And having our bodies washed with pure water. 
Well, one is baptized into Christ by being baptized in water. And there's no power in the water, but the blood of Christ shed for the remission of our sins is applied to us when we're baptized into his death in that water. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And that will be covered in this passage in about verse 22. Well, you rise to walk in newness of life. Your sins are remitted. He remembers your sins and iniquities against you no more. So we hold fast the confession of our hope. And we do not waver. Well, when you confess your faith in Christ before you obey the gospel, and then you're baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ in order to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins, Galatians 3.27, and again, Acts 2. 38 and chapter 22 of Acts verse 16, then we're going to confess Christ daily in our actions also. And we're going to be therefore obedient unto death if necessary. And if we live and die natural causes, we'd say until death. Verse 23. You see, he's writing to, to Jews who know full well the teaching of the law of Moses. And so he takes that material from the Old Testament and reminds them of what they believed in the gospel of Christ, which is now God's power to save. Romans 1 verse 16. But unlike Paul, they were becoming ashamed of the gospel due to persecution because they were Christians. And he's telling them you can't be ashamed of it. Here's the process whereby you became a Christian. Then you notice that he says... In verse 24, that we are to provoke one another unto love and good works. That's admonition. We admonish each other as brothers and sisters to be faithful. And to do the things God says Christians ought to do. Well, one of them is worship. And yet all of this is basically going on, as, he, as the context of it brings out, within the worship assembly. Notice we're... Not uh, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Thus there is a gathering together of Christians for the purpose of worshiping God. And the acts of worship exhort each of us as we direct it to God to be stronger and faithful. Think of the singing for a moment. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You see, when we're singing these songs, that's why we're so concerned that they be scriptural. We are teaching and admonishing one another. And think of the songs that provoke us unto love and good works. And the same is true as we all go to God in prayer. Knowing what the Bible teaches about the petitions that children of God lay before the Father. And asking always in harmony with his will and with the reality that he knows better for us. So we say, not our will, but thine be done. Then therein we're benefiting from all of that. The same is true when it comes to the, uh, the observance of the Lord's Supper. To collectively remember what Jesus did for us and the agony and the shame upon him. And yet the love that caused him to go through it. Why? So we could be. So we could be Christians of Christ. The opportunity to show forth some of that sacrifice in what we made and setting apart cheerfully as we've been prospered, funds for the work of the Lord's church. You know, we read many times in the Old Testament how they brought lambs and goats and bullocks according to the authority of the law and pigeons and turtle doves to offer. And they offered them literally over those 1,500 years by the millions have you, and there, then there was the other kind of sacrifices of things that they had raised and all this kind of thing. The various sacrifices so that uh, they are reminded continually that whatever you are and have, it all came from God. And that's one way we do it when we contribute of our means as we've been prospered cheerfully for God loves a cheerful giver. Do you ever think of yourself as that Jew back there? Offering up an offering when you make your contribution of funds to the church for the work of the Lord. Of offering up an offering that is a sweet smelling savor in his sight. Or maybe with the way some of us give it might stink. That's all up to the attitude of heart. And understanding your desire in the worship assembly. 
to contribute of your means, that you have given serious thought to what you have. All of that's involved in the worship. Now, miss the worship, you miss all of this. And what does that say about the spiritual retardation of a person spiritually when they have other things more important than to assemble with the saints on the first day of the week to engage in these acts of worship? For each act of worship, while it's directed to God out of our love and esteem and devotion to Him, serves to exhort one another and to provoke one another to love and good works. So you see, we end up today going to Hebrews 10, 25 and like passages and say, here is the authority for you to come together and you sin if you don't normally. And yet what's being said in this passage is that you come into the assembly and therein you're exhorted and provoked by the actions in that assembly to be better. So we exhort to come to the assembly, but the scripture says faithful Christians in the assembly, in the acts of worship, are exhorted to greater faithfulness and continual steadfastness. So failure to live this way, knowing the truth of God regarding such assemblies of worship, puts us, and that's how he ends the passage, puts us in the category of those who willfully sin. Yes, I know I ought to. Yes, it's better. Yes, I wear the name Christian, but I choose to go somewhere else rather than assemble with the saints. And it's interesting that he put this willful sinning right here after what he had to say about the worship of sin. Willful sin is to say, yes, I know God expects that of me and I'm obligated to do it, but I've got something else more important to me. Now, I doubt most people will come out and say it that way. But you see, you don't have to come out and say, wherever you are, that's more important to you than to be with the saints and discharge your duty to God of the worship assembly and thus help the brethren by your words of exhortation in the worship be better. Because that's what you're saying by your example. And that example speaks such a sermon, for good or bad. So if we then do that, then we've engaged in one form of willful sin. You know what you ought to do, verses 26 and 27, but you choose otherwise. Now, we're not talking about missing these worship periods because you were sick. And this is a good time to say this. If you've got some sort of contagious disease, don't you come here. You're violating doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, some of them were talking on Facebook this week about their kids having strep throat. Well, I've had strep throat a number of times. Don't you bring those kids here and give me strep throat or you will hear a sermon. Well, I make my point, I hope you realize. And the same is true of adults. I've seen some adults drag in, you know, you can just see fever all over them. Well, I made it. Yeah, well, I didn't leave. I think elders have a right to say, go home, you're sick. We don't want it. That's not fellowship. At least not scriptural. And I, I exaggerate all of that to make a point that there are those things that can happen to us that God doesn't expect us to be here. And so when you're sick, in the true meaning of the word being ill with a disease or some uh, injury, then you don't have to be here. And you may have to stay home with somebody that is sick or somebody injured. Uh, it may be even when it comes to a job now and then, due to the nature of the job, uh, you may have to miss. Now, I think as a... You know, Matthew 6.33 comes into some of this, if not all of it. I don't know how it's a part of the Christian life. Matthew 6.33 doesn't cover. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I would hate to know that a person says, well, I want to go to heaven, I want to serve God, but I've taken me a job and I took it because it's what I was looking for and it pays more money than I'll ever get anywhere, but I can't be at any of the services of the church. Well, I think that's sin, just outright. But now and then, there some of those things come up that demand due to the nature of your work. You miss now and then. But that's not a routine. That's not one you've chosen where I'll just automatically, by doing my job, miss all the assemblies of worship of the church. And I'm never available to do anything 
Brethren, why would a child of God and all that being a child of God and a new creature in Christ and what you sought when you became a Christian ever encourage anybody to get themselves in that kind of thing? In fact, one of the problems with America for a long time is that people just out there chasing that almighty dollar that gets cheaper every year. <laughs> and uh, they don't have time for their families. They don't have time for other important matters such as the work of the church. You cannot wed yourself strictly to your job and be all you ought to be as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a mother. You can't do it. That just caused you to neglect a whole host of things. So I hope we understand there ought to be some what we would call common sense and judgment about those things. I think of, of medical doctors. I think of various emergency workers. Uh, things of that nature. People of that nature in that kind of job who at times have to miss. I'd hate to know that we had um, a paramedic, Corey, who you're on duty, but you're at church, and all of a sudden you get a call, and there's been a, a car wreck, and people are, are sick. And I said, well, they'll just have to lay there and bleed and hurt until I get through worshiping God. That just doesn't quite seem like what the New Testament teaches about loving your neighbors yourself. So it's obvious then that there are those things that a little common sense or reasoning uh, speaks of when it comes to certain things that keep you away from worship. But I never have seen people who understood those things I've just mentioned and were faithful as they ought to be, of course, that would use those things as excuses to miss most of the worship of the church or just do as they please when they got ready. Big difference in those things. We are discussing those who, as a matter of choice or preference, absent themselves from these assemblies. Now, what about Wednesday night? Well, you know, Wednesday night's midweek Bible study. You don't find that in your New Testament. Where's the authority for it? Because the elders have the authority to call the church together and thus have such a thing as midweek Bible study. Over in England, I remember one time back in the 80s, because they don't consistently, the churches of Christ don't consistently have their, quote, midweek Bible study, unquote, on Wednesday. So we wanted to visit with several churches, so we hit one church on Tuesday night, because that's when they had their mid midweek Bible study, and then the other one had on Wednesday, and the other on Thursday. So we went to each one. That way we could assemble with all of them and do what we were there to do. So these are set up by the elders. Now, those elders who set those assemblies, such as Wednesday night up for Bible study and a brief devotional, since it is by their authority they do that, then they can also say there are exceptions. And if somebody has to work, then that person has to work. It's not like the first day of the week worship. And yet still, there's the Matthew 6.33 that allows you to grow and develop on the basis of your understanding of putting God first. There's always room for growth and development in the church of the Lord as children of God. Because right now, in this smaller assembly, from what a lot of assemblies of worship are, uh, there's different degrees of knowledge of the Bible, different degrees of growth and development, different degrees of understanding, different degrees of faith. And that's the way it is. The main thing is to be in Christ and be faithful in Christ so you can grow. And as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. How could you have qualifications for men to meet to be elders or even the qualifications, of course, to meet to be deacons if it wasn't saying that there are those who are stronger in knowledge and practice of the truth and more proven than others, and thus they are worthy to be in those positions. Thus it shows and proves growth and development spiritually in the church and different people at those different stages. And notice, and he says here, he doesn't say the assembly, he says assembling, I-N-G. Thus they had the habit in the early church at this stage of having different assemblies. And not just the one on the first day of the week. Now, I primarily chosen the worship assembly on the first day of the week because elders are no elders. The church assembles on the first day of the week. And even then, somebody has to decide, will it be at 8 o'clock, 11 o'clock, or 2.30, or 6 o'clock at night? But nevertheless, the obligation is there to assemble and in that assembly do what the New Testament says Christians ought to do in worship on every first day of the week. Well, what does it mean to choose not to attend? Well, again, it demonstrates one's willfully doing so, contempt for spiritual things. In Romans 8, 5, and 9, for those who live according to the flesh, Paul writes, they set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. 
For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity or hate against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. The idea is then that the person who loves the Lord is a new creature in Christ who understands those things. He craves to experience all those things, including fellowship and worship, that will strengthen and cause him to grow more to be like the Lord. Spiritual things here are just simply the things the New Testament teaches that Christians ought to be busy about. In Galatians 6, 7, and 8, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. That's the idea. That's all brought out in those passages. That one and, and the one we just, uh, well, the one we just read in Romans. Letting it stand for both and we move on. If missing gathering, the gathering, the assembling of the saints, in other words, is due to worldly reasons, the cares of this world, what do you think will be the end result of it? It means choosing not to do something that you know is good for you when you choose to absent yourself from the assembling of yourselves together that's talked about in Hebrews 10.25. And James comments on people who do that. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. James 4.17. It means choosing not to give or receive encouragement from your brethren as you all worship in harmony in the assembly of the saints. Notice, and let us consider one another in order to stir up the love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. You know what it means when a person absents himself or herself from this assembly willfully? They don't want to engage in those acts of worship to God. Which acts of worship serve to exhort their brothers and sisters to be more faithful to God? They're missing a great opportunity, not just in worshiping God, but the side effect of it as we exhort one another. They don't want to be there and engage in that. They don't want to help me go to heaven. Now, I doubt they'd articulate it that plainly. That's exactly what they're doing. In Ephesians 5, 19, again, I remind you and let that stand up for every act of worship for it's obvious we're offering our praise to God and our adoration to Him, but in the process, we're exhorting one another by the words. When we choose to absent ourselves from such an assembly as this one, we simply choose to violate a direct uh, statement that authorizes us to be here. Hebrews 10, 25. We're commanded to be here. It's our obligation to be here and to do in this assembly what God said. And you do remember the definition of the Holy Spirit for sin. Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Would it be wrong to miss a thousand services? Well, I think everybody said, well, yeah. Well, how about, would it be wrong to miss 100 services? Would it be wrong to miss 10 services? Would it be wrong to miss one? It's not the number. It's the disposition of heart toward the obligation to assemble on the first day of the week. We, we, we like to think that it works that way, but it doesn't. So the question is, when does something become wrong, become sin in God's sight? In the number of times it's done, or possibly the location that's chosen? In other words, to make things as clear as I know how to make it, is murder wrong because of the number of times someone kills, or is it the action? Is stealing wrong because of the number of times someone steals, or is it the action? Is stealing wrong if you steal a million dollars, but it's not wrong if you steal someone's number two pencil that's half used up? You see, it's not yours whether it's a million dollars or whether it's that number two pencil half used up and the race are mostly gone. It's not yours. And you took it. That's sin. What does God need with a million dollars or a pencil? Some sins are done out of ignorance through weakness in our spirit or unintentionally. We don't want to. We labor not to, but we're humans and we fail. But how many of, of us at times made plans knowing that we would not be able to attend the worship assemblies of the saints? Rather, that's completely something else. 
It's saying, yes, I ought to be there, and yes, that's putting God first, but I choose to put this first. So often I've seen brethren take off on trips, vacations, whatever, and they, you know, we'll attend church we can, but that's no big deal. Where do we ever learn that from the Scriptures? By such Scriptures, we must give account to God someday. A Christian doesn't live a sinless life. But he should not be planning to violate a command of God. How can that be of Christ to plan to do that? To do what I said by absenting yourself from such an assembly as this means choosing to be ignorant of God's ways. You don't really need it. You don't really care much about it. But you do care about something, and what you care about is not being in this assembly. Israel of old was destroyed because of lack of knowledge. So Hosea said in Hosea 4.6, they, they sought, according to Paul, to establish their own righteousness, Romans 10 and verse 3. And one of the ways that we grow in spiritual things and the desire for spiritual things and even knowledge of the Word of God is to be in this worship assembly. Our knowledge must grow. Two times Peter said this, 2 Peter 1, 5, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory now and forever. Amen. Now I have from time to time, believe it or not, a few people tell me that they learned something from a sermon <laughs> that I preached. Well, I guarantee you, for whoever the preacher, and no matter how good he preaches and how well he knows the Bible, you don't learn from him if you're not there. We have our children's school because we understand uh, that on their own, most children find something more important to do than to learn. When people decide not to attend, the things they learn rapidly diminishes because they find other things to do than to learn about God's ways. And they're not exhorted to see what they could do and ought to do. They're not exhorted to see themselves as they actually are. And when we choose to be away, we are choosing to set a bad pattern of life before our brothers and sisters. Uh, before our, anybody we're before, our neighbors, our friends, our family, our spouse. We're setting a bad example for them. We're saying, go and do like I do. And I certainly consider myself a fine Christian. Well, aren't you in the worship assembly? No, there's something else I had to do. I, I remember meeting one person, well, I've met more than this, but come to the door and say, well, I'm here, so-and-so invited me. Well, guess where so-and-so was that invited him? They weren't there, but the person they invited was there. Now, well, that, that works a lot of good with folks. Yet we have this, this statement, let no one despise your youth, Paul says to Timothy. But be an example to the believers in word. Notice, not just those outside of Christ, but to your brothers and sisters in Christ. In conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 1 Timothy 4.12 And then Jesus had already taught in his, in his earthly ministry to let our light shine. Matthew 5.13-16 We are to influence others for good. It means when we choose not to be in this worship assembly or those like it, it means choosing to discourage the faithful. Have you ever been discouraged? Well, you have, if you haven't been, you haven't lived very long. You will be. And what do you do when you're discouraged? Well, if you stay discouraged, you throw up your hands and quit. But how does a person who's been discouraged come back from it? Well, you, you know what's right regardless of what anybody else does, and you go ahead and do it anyway. But there are those folks who don't have strong faith, strong confidence in God. But they think you're some fine person. And when you are not in the assembly or apply this to all the avenues of service to the Lord and the church, then what kind of message have you just sent? In other words, by the actions you're choosing, let's say right now, the actions you're choosing, are you telling me to go and do that likewise? Now where would we be today <laughs> if we did that? Perhaps you think the faithful never get discouraged. All I can say is you're wrong. 
The reason they're faithful and remain faithful, they don't let it get them down. But they lament the fact that other people think of themselves as fine, upstanding Christians, and yet the worship assembly to them is there when they want to come or don't want to come, and it doesn't bother them at all to miss for some affair of this world. We learn from Acts 28, 15, such a man in his faithful service to God as the Apostle Paul took heart and was encouraged when he saw others who were willing to meet with him in his work that he did. Now, I suggest to you, if Paul needed some encouragement, all of us do. Well, I mean, that means I must ask, are you a discouragement to somebody else? By your actions, are you a discouragement? Especially in just this worship assembly. There have been times in other places where I've known of that was the only people there. One family, the only people at the church. Nobody else was there. And I remember early on at the little church where I first started preaching a long, long time ago. Because there were so few. I came and I taught the class. I made the announcements. I led the singing. I presided at the Lord's table and passed it all out. Did the preaching. And sang my own invitation song. What if everyone decided to attend the worship assemblies as often as you? And we'll add to that and do the other things that God expects Christians to do to be faithful. Would the church grow and prosper or would it wither and die from a lack of interest? Uh, let's just carry that a little further. Would you want everybody to handle problems like you handle them? Would you criticize me if I quit preaching for the same reason you're going to quit various things you do in the church? What would you think of me? Or any other person who professes to be a preacher of the gospel as we commonly understand it. If one member can choose to attend or not attend, then two can. And if two can, then ten can. And if ten can, you are a ten can. <laughs> You see, your choice is set the pace or drag the rest down. That's what you will do by your actions. Well, I won't do that, yeah. You will either, you will either set the pace of Christian living or you will be dragging other people down. Now, they may not let you drag them down, but some you will drag down. Just as when you live the best life you know how, you may not be able to pull others up with you, but some you will impact for good, and there'll be better people because of you. There's no other recourse. So what you plan to do, the reason you plan to do it, I could do that too, couldn't I? And God would say, that's just exactly what I want Christians to do. No man's an island to himself, beloved. We all live in such a way as we impact others. And we're either discouraging them by our plans and our purposes and our actions. Or we're encouraging. Now you say, well, there's another one. What is it? What is, what is the other one? If, it's, if your life's not encouraging people, the only thing you can be doing is discouraging people. Now what's the other choice? What's the other thing it's going to do as far as wielding influence over others? It's not. And so in our assembly is a worship. We see what the Bible says. We know the obligation. And yet it should be coming to us because of our love for the truth and in seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, knowing all these things shall be added unto us. Attendance, to say the least, is very important for various reasons. And for a child of God who purports to be a Christian to just miss whenever they get ready, something else is more important. Something's wrong with that person inwardly. If you're a child of God and you've let the affairs of this world become more important to you, so that it's not only keeping you away from worship from time to time, but stopping you from doing a lot of other things the Lord expects you to do to be faithful, you need to seriously know you've sinned and you stand separated from God and you need to repent. Now, if you need to obey the gospel, we studied the beginning of this sermon how you do that. And we hope you'll do that. And what better time than now as we exhort you to act and do what's right and the encouraging words of this song of invitation for you to do it. Let's engage in that song and come to him while we stand and sing.